All right, so this is going to be a relatively short uh, chapter. It is chapter eight, transportation, storage, and security. And we'll dive right into it. So let's talk about transportation. Um, accidents can occur at any point in the supply chain. That's from the manufacturer, the shipping company, the retailer, and the end user, which is typically us. Uh, preventing accidents is the first line of defense when it comes to you know not having any sort of spills or anything like that. Um, the timing of the response can greatly affect the severity of the accident. So how quickly you respond to a spill or a damaged container or a hose being punctured is going to greatly determine you know how bad of an incident it was. Um, you always want to make sure that your vehicle is mechanically sound. It can perf you want to perform regular inspections, including the equipment being transported. Uh, carry replacement parts to make field repairs. That's mainly for your um, sprayers, your ride-on sprayers, your skid sprayers, backpacks, things like that. Uh, never carry pesticides in the passenger area of your vehicle. Carry the minimum amount of pesticide needed, which that's kind of hard, right? Because... Let's be honest, you never really know how much you're going to need unless you have like a determined route and it's really dialed in. But that's, I don't know. Try and do your best to have as, as little of pesticide as possible in your vehicle. Also, cargo boxes make additional security for pesticides. Uh, on our trucks, we have toppers and those toppers are locked. They can be locked. So that's our security instead of a cargo box. Let's talk about the operator, typically you driving around in the vehicle. Um, driver and owner of the company are accountable for injuries and or pesticide releasing into the environment. So if you get into an accident and you have, say, a rollover and your skid that's full of mixed solution spills all over the highway, you're going to be held responsible as well as the company. And your um, certified applicator license, you know, that's how they can hold you responsible. So be aware of that. Drive defensively. Obviously, do your best not to get in any sort of car accidents. Uh, the operator is the first responder to contain the spill. You know, obviously, if the accident wasn't that bad and you're conscious, you need to respond. Um, ideally, you can contain the spill before the first responders get there. But, you know, that all depends you know if it's safe to do so because you're in the highway and people are flying by you there's a lot of things a lot of variables out there but basically you need to establish a basic emergency response plan how do you respond to an incident or an accident how do you respond to a hose malfunctioning you need to think of all these things and if if you haven't been trained on these things in your company uh, bring it up. Say, hey, we need to we need to do this. We need to have a plan, and we need to practice that plan. Um, it'll only make you guys better. Some drivers will require to follow DOT regulations. That depends on truck weight, amount of pesticide being carried, etc. So, some additional safety precautions. You always want to carry labels and SDS sheets in the vehicle when you're transporting pesticides. You know, like I told you in a previous chapter, we always carry a binder that's full of every single product that we use, and it has all their labels and all their SDS sheets. It's organized. It has a table of contents in the front, so you can very quickly find what you need to find. I highly recommend that you do that. It does take some time to print it out. Uh, it does take some time to hole punch it, put it in the binder, to staple everything, to organize the table of contents. It takes time, and it's not cheap. Paper's not that cheap. But in the long run, once you build it, you have it and it's done. So that's something that you should do or, you know, the company that you work for should do. You also, you always want to carry a spill kit. You want to carry a large enough spill kit that you can contain what you need to. Um, honestly, I was thinking about this the other day, those large tanker trucks. There's no possible way that they could carry a spill kit to contain all of that liquid. What they could carry would be a bunch of um, dikes, right? Absorbent material that they can put around a spill to hold it in. And that would be their best chance of um, containing a giant massive spill. 
Now, hopefully you don't have to run into that, but you do want to carry as much as you possibly can to contain a spill. Um, you want to inspect. You want to inspect your containers. You want to inspect your lids. You want to inspect to see if there's any punctures, tears. Did anything happen while you're driving? You know, you hit a pothole. Did anything shift? Did a valve break? You know, did a hose get loose? Did a, a hose clamp get loose? You always want to inspect your equipment. Uh, it's also something, you know, as, as an arborist, you want to inspect your climbing equipment, right? You want to inspect your pesticide equipment. It's for your safety and the safety of the environment. And again, that's your responsibility. Uh, you want to secure your equipment. How do you lock it down? You know, most skids are bolted to beds of trucks, whether they're flatbed Isuzu's or pickup trucks, they're generally bolted in. If you have backpacks, how are you going to secure a backpack? Do you have backpack storages? Do you have, um, you know, bungee cords storing them? How are, how are you doing it? Just make sure that they're secure. Okay. Now let's talk about vehicle placards. And I don't have the picture of the placards here, but it is in the manual, in the National Corps manual. You can also very easily Google um, vehicle placards and uh, chemical placards, things like that. And you'll have a pretty good idea of what they look like. Uh, the DOT requires diamond-shaped signs that display what type of hazardous materials being carried. Placards share vital information with first responders. Information like, is it flammable? Is it poisonous? Is it an inhalation hazard, et cetera? And it's required for containers larger than 119 gallons or quantities greater than 1,000 pounds. So it really depends on what you're carrying. Uh, will dictate if you have placards. Let's talk about some storage facilities. So it's best to have a separate storage facility for pesticides, fertilizers, and similar products. Um, the best management practices of pesticide storage sites are to limit access. You know, only make it available for people to go in there that need to go in there. You know, whether they need to top off their trucks or their inventory in the trucks. Um, you know, the person restocking it, the owner. You know, don't just let anybody be able to walk in there. Um, it also, it allows you when you have a storage site and you limit the access, it allows you to have better inventory. So you can stay on top of what you have. You can see what's there, see what you're missing, see what you need to order, uh, protects others from exposure. When you have a locked up security storage site, because you're not, you're not allowing people in, right? It's pretty common sense. Um, having a storage site reduces the possibility of contaminating the environment because it's all located in one spot. It's not scattered around. It's not on the floor. It's not, I mean. You get what I'm saying. Uh, prevents damage, prevent damage to pesticide products from temperature swings. So when you have a bunch of products in a storage area that has a, a monitored temperature, then obviously they're not going to degrade as fast. You know, they're going to be in better condition than something that has large swings in temperature and moisture. You're also going to safeguard your pesticide products from unauthorized users, right? So maybe somebody who's not licensed goes in there and they need to go kill something at their house when they shouldn't be in there. You know, you're going to save yourself from people accessing that stuff. It's also a designated area to help firefighters. So what if there's a fire in your building? You know, now they know where the pesticide storage area is. They can take extra precautions for that. And obviously you want to keep it locked and you want to post warning signs. So... You also want to prevent water damage. Uh, never place pesticide storage areas in flood zones. Why? Because if your pesticide storage area gets flooded, products can contaminate that water, and then you're going to have runoff and leaching to God knows where. So you do not want that to occur. So do not build a pesticide storage area in a flood zone. You want to consider the soil and land characteristics. Are you on the edge of a cliff where stuff could run off right down into a stream? Uh, is it sandy soil? Is it clay? You know, what do you have going on? And then um, you want to store your pesticides on raised shelves or pallets. Keep them up off the ground. Uh, that could also be for, you know, rodents. You know, say a rodent gets in and starts chewing on some, some products. He could pop a hole in a jug and all of a sudden now you have a massive spill of whatever on the ground. And same thing with granules. Uh, prevent act. You want to prevent excess moisture and humidity because that can affect mainly granule pesticides. It can cause them to clump up. Be conscious of metal containers because they can rust. Paper and cardboard containers can crumble. Labels can peel off or become unreadable. Uh, dry pesticides can clump, degrade, dissolve. 
and slow release products can release their active ingredient. So what does the ideal storage facility look like? Well, it's got temperature control. You might have exhaust fans just in case. You have good lighting so you can see what you're working with. You can see if anything's leaking. You can you want to be able to see. Uh, you want to use impervious surfaces, whether that be metal, plastic, or concrete, or all of the above. Uh, you want to store pesticide containers safely in original containers. They also have pesticide storage lockers that actually have a collection tray down at the bottom. They're not expensive, but they're also not very cheap. They're anywhere from, you know, like a thousand bucks all the way up to three, four thousand bucks. But it's an area that it's just added storage, right? And they also make these lockers to where they're, you know, relatively safe in a fire. They can withstand certain amounts of fires, just like a, a gun safe. Um, you want to inspect your containers regularly because you also want to have good inventory, right? Check the shelf life of your products. You want to keep a spill kit on site readily available. Also, I would recommend to keep a fire extinguisher on site if you can. It doesn't hurt to have that. Same thing with an eyewash station. It didn't mention that in the book, but I would also have an eyewash station just in case at your facility. So pesticide site security. Uh, you want to make minimizing risk for anyone a top priority. Uh, you want to create a plan for worst case scenarios. What happens if this, then this, if this, then that. You want to have all these things thought of in a plan and you want everyone to understand the plan. Uh, a good quality security system can't hurt. It can also help you reduce loss or interruptions. You know, God forbid somebody comes in and steals all of your products. Then what happens? Um, there's actually uh, a friend of mine down in, I believe it was Missouri. Uh, his facility, a couple of guys went in there and decided to uh, do arson to his trucks. And so now he's out of his trucks and you can think of the disruption that had on his day and week and month dealing with that. And if he would have had a good security system, fences and cameras and everything else, you know, he might have, that might have not happened. Um, you also want to, a good security plan can reduce insurance costs. So if you guys are out there intending to be business owners, a good thing to, to think about, you could submit your security plan to your insurance company underwriters and they might be able to give you a better rate. Um, it also protects your intellectual property and improves relationships with your community. You also want to perform risk assessments. Now, as an arborist, we perform risk assessments on trees, but this is a risk assessment of your facility. And I would also go a step further. I know this chapter is talking about storage and transportation, stuff like that. But you want to do a risk assessment on every site that you perform a pesticide application. What's going on? What could happen? What is the worst that could happen? Think of all the scenarios, right? I train my applicators to think that way. You want to make a site assessment before you even pick up a pesticide. You know, what's down the street? Is somebody riding a bike towards you? Is somebody pushing a stroller with a baby in it? You want to know what's going on around you. So that way you don't scare people. You know, you're conscious and courtesy. You know, it's, it's a courtesy to look out for others. But you also need to establish training programs for employees. Like I said, that emergency response plan, including safety and security procedures, uh, prevent unauthorized entry, secure your equipment and vehicles, and keep an accurate inventory. It's nice to know what you have and make sure that nobody's stealing your stuff.